Welcome to the First Church in Chestnut Hill and to our service for September 13, 2020. Uh, as we enter into the fall, we hope to be making some additions to our lineup, particularly some new voices coming uh, in October. And uh, hopefully our quartet will be able to be all together here at the church. But until that is possible, we give thanks for the music that they have provided us and also for the great work of Catherine, our music director, and her own performing on the piano. Now for the readings, beginning with the Psalm 114. When Israel went out from Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his dominion. And the sea looked and fled, Jordan turned back. The mountains skip like rams, the hills like lambs. Why is it, O sea, that you flee? O Jordan, that you turn back? O mountains, that you skip like rams? O hills like lambs? Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turns the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a spring of water. Next, from the book of Exodus, chapter 14 verses 19 to 22. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other, all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night, and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall from, for them on their right and on their left. So ends the reading.
what did we hear? And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. I imagine this is like a thundercloud looming in the sky, separating one group from the other. Earlier on, this is described as a cloud by day and a fire by night. The cloud contains the fire, which is unseen in daylight, but visible in the darkness. Well, the cloud and fire, they blocked the passage of the Egyptians, those who were pursuing Moses and the Israelites. These people are referred to as an army, but they're an army in the sense that there are a lot of people. 600 Egyptians chasing 600,000 men, plus a few million or so men, uh, women and children. It's not a small gathering. Moses is leading these people away from captivity. Pharaoh has sent his uh, chariots to stop them, to bring them back. If you paint the picture of these two opposing groups, it's a bit absurd. A few hundred men trying to ride down a million or so. It makes you wonder what those 600 charioteers were hoping to accomplish. And yet a small number of people have been known to control the fate of millions. Moses leads the people to the sea, sometimes described as the Red Sea, sometimes the Reed Sea. One is a huge body of water that opens up to the Indian Ocean. The other is a marshy area, probably much like the Florida Everglades. Moses calls upon God and the waters recede. We don't hear what happens after that, but it's worth noting that chariots will follow them down onto the dry land. And when the waters rush back, the charioteers will die. They were no longer deterred by the fire and smoke, so the Egyptians followed the fleeing men, women, and children. It didn't work out well. And how are we supposed to feel about this? Did our team win, those following Moses being our team? Do we mentally number ourselves among their ranks, or is that just the story we tell? As we consider passages from the Bible, we might be inclined to prop ourselves up in certain roles, taking on certain perspectives. But it's worth examining each of these views, not because they're equally valid, mind you, but because it's worth checking our aspirations against our actions or inactions. Who are we in the story? Moses splitting the waters? Or are we the Hebrew slaves, the one, one of the many tired and troubled people trying to find their way out of subjugation? One of those delivered, one of those who are following along. But what about those in the chariots? Anyone see themselves in that role? One of the oppressors. Or conversely, one of the poor fools who was just following a pharaoh's orders. Because what were they supposed to do? You know, they were soldiers. A life spent protecting the kingdom, or perhaps a life spent you know, propping up the desires of a king. I'm sure no one raised their hand and said, I'm pharaoh, the guy in charge, the guy calling the shots, the guy who's also has a heart hardened by God. That phrase, the hardened heart, is uh, used several times in the book of Exodus. Do we blame Pharaoh for acting upon God's influence? How would we then read the story? Well, after facing the many plagues sent by God, Pharaoh allows the Hebrew people to go but then he changes his mind abruptly. And then these charioteers, they died catering to the whims of their leader. And once through the sea, the people seem to be saved, at least for the moment, and just for the moment. For much of the book of Exodus, these same people are just wandering around in the wilderness. They're looking for food and water. They're bitterly complaining about their troubles. And at various moments, these same people say that they were just better off back in Egypt and the relative comforts of slavery, compared to all of these uncertainties that they're facing on the way to the promised land. It would not be until 40 years later that the group would make it to Israel. In fact, if you skip ahead a bit, you learn that none of the Hebrew slaves actually cross over into Israel. Each one of them would die over the course of that 40 years, and that includes Moses himself. Was it worth it? Was it worth enduring 
decades of suffering in the hope that the next generation would enjoy the fruits of freedom? If I were to have told any one of those slaves that it would be your children or your grandchildren blessed with freedom, would they themselves want to have wandered through the wilderness? Would they have been interested in taking up that bargain? Would any of us? Well, now for something completely different. Unitarians in New England have an old tradition. It was customary to go away in the summer, to take off from church and from work and from whatever, just to go away. Massachusetts folks would travel somewhere. You'd go to the Cape and the islands. You'd go up country to Maine or Vermont or New Hampshire. You'd go out to the Berkshires. And I will note that this is a luxury. It is a luxury to have the ability to take time away from one's responsibilities. And whether one is dealing with farm work or office work, raising crops or raising a family, it's not an option for everyone. Anyway, once that summer break was over, depending on whether you went anywhere, people would eventually come back to church. Sometime in the 1980s, someone came up with the notion of having a special ritual to mark that ingathering, that return to the meeting house, and it was called the water ceremony. The idea was that you would bring back some water from where you had gone, from the beach, from the mountains, wherever. And then you would take that water and you would come up during the service and you would pour it into a central bowl. And you would say to people, this water came from somewhere. Basically what I did on my summer vacation with a prop. And you can imagine what people would say. I went to Martha's Vineyard, I went to Lake George, I went to the Pacific Ocean. But what about those who couldn't have gone away, who didn't have the opportunity? I got the water from the tap in Boston. I got it from the Charles River. The ceremony in that way could be quite embarrassing for those who didn't have the time or the wherewithal to go somewhere for the summer. And I've never felt inclined to offer that ceremony for that reason. Sunday morning should be focused on the common purposes we share rather than the many differences we may have to um, justify between ourselves, among ourselves. But isn't that sort of what the scriptures were talking about this morning? That there are differences. Differences between Israelite and Egyptian. Differences between Hebrew slaves and the forthcoming generations of their children and grandchildren. A cloud of fire keeping one group apart from the other. Differences. And yet, is it really the purpose of the Bible to mark those distinctions, to set up bright lines between the high and the low, the righteous and the wicked, the haves and the have-nots? And notice those are not the same categories. Being high versus low means there's some way of determining who is high and who is low. There's some measure. Higher class, higher education, higher merit. And higher means better. Righteous and wicked are similar, which is distinguishing the behaviors of people. What were the people supposed to do? Well, what are we supposed to do? The Israelites wandering, wandering in that wilderness were saved, but they were also being punished. Even Moses was punished for failing to follow the exact dictates of God. They were righteous and wicked all in one. Finally, what does it mean to have versus to not have, to be wealthier to be poor, to be hungry and thirsty, or well-fed and well-watered, to be welcomed into a community or to be kept outside as a stranger, to have one another or to be alone. And are any of these various distinctions a reflection of God or of God's blessings upon us, blessings showered down upon the worthy and no one else? Or are these differences of status or behavior simply the shifting circumstances of life, the luck or the misfortune of someone rather than anything that God decided. There are ways of reading the Bible to support the notion that God determined that these people are better than those people. High or low because God decided. Righteous or wicked because they were selected. That's just how it goes. Wealthy because God showered them with prosperity and the others not so much. I mention this not because I believe any of that distinction stuff. I don't. I mention it because, sadly, that's not an unusual opinion 
within the ranks of modern religion, certainly modern Christianity. Leaf through the Bible and you can pick out lines and phrases that support the notion that God plays favorites. You can read about the parting of the Red Sea and decide, well, that's just God choosing. But reading just those lines and just those phrases is only part of the story. And if you stop there, it's a big mistake. Stepping over the threshold into a religion is about accepting an invitation. It's an invitation to join a community of people. It's an invitation to enter into a relationship with God. And that sense of invitation is about the beginning of expectations. It's not about the end of them. The community is a place of shared vision, common values. And being in such a community helps us to adopt and to maintain a perspective. But not to become oblivious to everyone else, not to close out the wider world. This community is about support and fellowship, not exclusivity, not alienation. And understanding our relationship with God is similar. It's about trying to enter into a sense of harmony with the divine. And yet we must try to do that even with full knowledge that we're not going to get it done perfectly. We're not even going to do it terribly well at times. Which brings us back to that community of people helping and urging one another along. We need both the community and the relationship with God to balance the other out. Think back to the story of the Israelites wandering for 40 years. In a community of people of mutual support and fellowship, the group may be wandering, but they're doing it together. They're heading in the direction that God is guiding them, together with the goal of making the world a little bit better for one another and for those generations to come. These Israelites did suffer. But if I told a younger version of myself that you're going to have to suffer, you will have to face many disappointments, that younger version might be concerned, but that older version would be like, yeah, so that's what you really should have expected. That's life. That's the problem with facing existential questions alone, outside of a community of people. Those younger versions may brashly think that Onward and upward, and everything is possible, without any sense of perspective. The older versions look back upon everything, all that they've done, even what they've suffered, everything they've accomplished to reach a moment in time. Now you take those younger, brasher, enthusiastic versions of ourselves, and you blend them in with older, wiser, calmer souls, and you get a community, just like I'm describing. It's grounded while also being vibrant. We are meant to be those various versions plucked from time and put together. We're different and we're the same. We're at different stages of our lives. We are the eager spirits looking toward the horizon and we're the seasoned souls looking back and helping others along. There are no lines to be drawn. There are no walls to be built and gates to be guarded. Community should not be about who's in and who's out, but who we are together. It's not winning a race, it's walking along the road as a community. Even if it's through the wilderness, even if it takes decades to get wherever we think we're going, the mistake is to worry about drawing those lines of separation. And the challenge is to realize that there aren't any lines, or at least there's not supposed to be. There are only groups we inhabit together finding a way toward the horizon. When Moses parted those waters, he was helping the people overcome an obstacle. And yet by passing through the sea, the people would then face years of struggle, years of difficulty. Moses is not to be blamed for parting the waters because he continued on with those people. He helped them by sharing their burdens, by guiding them in all of their wanderings. You can help someone by parting the waters, but that doesn't mean you can take away all the challenges that they're going to face in life. It's just not going to happen. It's not fair or realistic or even wise. The real miracle was never to be found on the shores of the Red Sea. The true miracle was spending 40 years helping one another. That's the miracle of a community. And that's a miracle you really can only find in church. So ends our sermon. May 
nothing evil across this door, and may ill fortune never pry about these windows, may the roar and rain go by. By faith made strong, the rafters will. Withstand the battering of the storm. This heart, though all the world grow chill, will keep you warm. He shall walk softly through these rooms, touching our lips with holy wine, till every casual corner. After drown the rock shout, and though these sheltering walls are thin, may they be strong to keep hate out and hold love in. Let's end together by saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our service is ended. May our service to God and to one another never truly end. Be safe, be well. And God bless you all. Amen.